I would like to introduce this morning our community conversations leader. Um, it is Professor Cheryl Jurgens, who is a professional artist and entrepreneur and college professor who is currently at Wilberforce University in the Arts and Humanities Department. She's also a licensed therapist, and I can tell that she's really good. <laughs> massage, I'm sorry. Massage. <laughs> <laughs> you need mental health? Yes. <laughs> a whole other area, right? <laughs> she's also a longtime uh, resident of Yellow Springs with multiple skill sets that she has contributed to a variety of community-based organizations here in the country and as well as across the country. Uh, here in Yellow Springs as well as across the country. Cheryl is the project director for the Wheeling Gump Sculpture Project that is being coordinated by the Yellow Springs Arts Council. Today's discussion um, will center around the council's efforts to erect the life-size bronze statue of Willing Gaunt, who many of you probably know, was a ph uh, philanthropist and landowner in the village of Yellow Springs and made multiple contributions to the community. So, without any further rambling, I introduce to you Cheryl Durkins. very much for the invitation. Um, I am really honored to be here. Um, this is actually a really lovely occasion um, for me personally. And I'm actually going to do what I did last night, which is I do kind of, in a, kind of a picture so that I can have the perspective of the audience. So I'm actually, if it's okay, I'm going to grab my cell phone and just take a picture of everybody, all these beautiful faces here. Um, <laughs> Because I just really think it's important to have multiple perspectives. <laughs> so, because that's the prevailing theme I think we have in society right now. <laughs> perspective. <laughs> so, um, I'm super informal about this, but I want to kind of give a little bit of a background of um, who I am, how I came to be part of the pulling off project, and then to talk about kind of the meat of the project itself. So I did grow up in Yellow Springs. I was born and raised here. Um, and I knew at the age of 18 that I was never coming back. Um, I was out, uh, you know, for the world. Uh, I lived, I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. I, um, after college, came back here for a little while, but then spent a lot of years in Philadelphia. And then Philadelphia was where I got my art degree, MFA in studio art. And I also picked up another degree in um, cultural studies, and then moved to Brooklyn briefly. Um, like many people, I had parents that were aging, and I came home for eight weeks eight years ago. <laughs> it became very clear that I was needed here. And so I um, took care, I was a caregiver with my sister for my mom for several years. She passed away um, in December of 2018. But that experience I never would trade for the world. It was really important, <clears throat> excuse me, that I come back. So I took a big, huge time to do a major temper tantrum around the idea of returning. But when I got settled in, what I recognized was that there were changes, quite frankly, that I was not comfortable with that were occurring in Yellow Springs. That there were things that needed to be remembered and honored, and I was so glad to know that the 365 Project has been kind of on the front lines for preserving a lot of African American culture in particular, but it's not just about African American culture, frankly. It is about really having a diverse population of all incomes as well, and all, about all walks of life. And that is what I feel we're really facing a threat. Well, we know we're a threat. Um, so, Part of what happened with Will and Gaunt was that it was the quickest hire that I have ever had in my life. I had a very good friend, many of you know Jamie Sharp, 
who runs the Yellow Springs Toy Company. And she was originally going to be the project director for the Willie Knox Sculpture Project. And what happened was she opened her business and got completely slammed. Um, I have a background. I used to be a project manager for the City of Philadelphia Mural Arts Program, which um, has more murals in the world than any other city. When I left, there were 3,000 murals in the city. And so I had a lot of public art experience. And she asked me to be a part of the committee to put together the sculpture project. So I was like, sure, you know, I'll be a part. There's meetings and everything like that. Well, then she said, well, I can't do this position. Do you know anybody who would be able to do that? And so I was like, I thought about it. I really did. I was like, it's not going to be me. <laughs> I really thought it. Yeah, right. I really was like, is there anybody? But the truth of the matter, it needed to be a diverse group of people. There needed to be people that represented the body of Yellow Springs and the spirit of Yellow Springs. So I just said to Jamie, I said, well, if you want to talk to the committee, you know, I would consider taking on the project. Um, I don't really think about it, though. Um, I was, you know, dealing with, I was inundated with caregiving and, you know, just, you know, head above water and stuff like that with a lot of different things in my life. And so we, so I went to, the, this was the first committee meeting. It was my birthday. And... At the committee meeting, the members were like, who wants her to be the project manager? Everybody, Everybody. raised their hand, congratulations, you're the project manager, let's start. So that's exactly how that piece of it came. But what I will say is this, before that even happened, decades of work had been done in terms of the investigation and research of Will and Don's life. And much of that, we have to Miss Phyllis Jackson for the Yellow Springs. She was really her and another woman, uh, the late Pat Matthews. They were really the people that did a lot of the legwork and got us to a point where we could even consider next steps and how to honor them. So first, I want to say first and foremost, Miss Jackson went to Kentucky she encountered some challenges in Kentucky uh, related to um, racism even in her research. Um, you know, there were, there were, there was, she just did, like I just can't even explain copious amounts of research. And I know that generations before, there were people that were talking about honoring Willing God. And I wanna also honor that because I think part of the issue that we have uh, is that we don't always recognize the lay work that went before. Like you see my face, but understand that I came in at the tail end. All right, this is, this is, you know, Willie Gott was alive to now. And so what happened then also was that there was another group of people in Yellow Springs, primarily um, Stephen Dill and um, Nancy, Wheel, and Halen. Oh my gosh, forgive me, Nancy. Lost her last name, but they, yes. Melon. Melon, thank you. Erica. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that was crazy. Um, they had moved into Will and God's home, and they recognized the history of who he was. And so it was a, almost like a kitchen table talk with a group of people. And they decided that we needed to do something to honor the man. And so for those of you who may not know where Will and God's houses are, they're on Walnut Street. So you know where the longing mat is. There are three cottages to the right. And then there's a house uh, that sits uh, to the right as well. Um, and that's the house that he resided in. However, there are other houses that he owned on that block. And I'll get to that in a minute. So they're sitting and they're saying, we need to do something about this process. And we need to maybe honor him through a sculpture. And the reason why that comes in is because um, 
the sculptor Brian Mon, and his wife, Marie, also lived in a house owned by Brian. Mm -hmm. And he had a sculpture studio that was kind of built on, you know, later. But that was where he worked. And so you have this kind of synchronicity of things happening and coming together and people finally having, um, I don't know, I would say the time is right. You know, that's the way that I would put it. And so what happened then is that a committee was developed and there was an initial outreach of people some of whom have remained with the process, other people have fallen away but are in spirit here. Um, and they started to convene meetings. And they decided that they were gonna raise money for a willing God sculpture. And they had to come up with a budget. And you know, the bronze life-size sculpture is not you know, it's not like going down to Goodwill and picking up a trophy for a dollar. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a whole process. And so what they did was they started putting out feelers into the community to say, hey, we want to do this project. What do you think? Would you get behind it? Would you support it? And um, Excuse me. really, I have not heard a negative thing about this project since it started. It's like really, you know, I'm going to knock on <laughs> laminate. <laughs> um, but really, it is one of those projects where people are just like, yeah, we need to do this. It's not, you know, in terms of any kind of controversy related to the, the overall project. And so, July 4th, 2017, they um, created a Willing Dot puppet. They had um, Dave Newhart's tractor. And they took it to the streets and launched this idea of a Willing Dot sculpture project. That's when it first initially started. I came on in January of 2018. So that's kind of the background back. In the meantime, the budget was $169,000. And, that's, and it was um, spearheaded through the Yellow Springs Arts Council. And we all know the Yellow Springs Arts Council is, is, is small, it's, it's very nimble. Um, and they also will <coughs> acknowledge that they struggle with capacity. And so there was a question about whether or not even this could happen. Um, and so through the sculpture um, committee that they established that was you know, oh, that was separate from the Yellow Springs Arts Council. Um, they brought in volunteers who could help with that process. And so, to date, we've raised um, a little over $100,000. Yes. We have $60,000 to go. And um, we have done that through a combination of individual giving. And I think it is respectful to say that individual donors have donated $20,000 of that, which is pretty amazing when you're talking about five and $10 here and there. And um, we've gotten government, not government, excuse me, grant funding um, through the, well, yeah, through the Ohio Arts Council. Um, so we have that, we have the Yellow Springs Community Foundation has been a big supporter. Um, they, have to they have given a total of $16,000 in multiple years on the Arthur Morgan Foundation. Um, so we do have this kind of community effort um, with local, with this hybrid of local givers and then regional. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the artist, um, Marlon Mon. He came on and um, his work, well, I mean, he did Hank Aaron. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, I just can't, I, every time I just think that's amazing. So, you know, um, I told him, like, when we had these open houses, I was like, did you know that your sculpture is featured in a Netflix documentary? <laughs> and he was just like, what? You know, that kind of thing. I said, yeah, you got it. Yo, right. So, 
you know, it's just he's he's an amazing artist. I know he is he's actually overcome a lot of health challenges himself. He's a cancer survivor, and he has really put his heart and soul into this project as well. Um, we have also built programming around it. We did a um, mural project, and that mural was created in um, the Yellow Springs Arts Council um, in the back room, and is now called the Will and Gaunt Room, Reading Room. But here's how it coordinates with the uh, 365 project. They have a specific Will and Gaunt tour that they have developed, and they use that reading room as a stop on the tour so that they can present materials and ideas, not just around Will and Gaunt, but around um, you know, the history of Ellis Springs. So from this simple sculpture where the location, the final location, will be um, the Ron Park. And for those of you who don't know where that is, think subway on the edge of town, cross over to the um, old train station. There's a little park where the hands used to be. That's where it's going to be. So you have people being greeted with Will and God at that town, uh, at that site. And really strategically, we decided to do that because you have, um, there are like three schools that can grow with walking distance of that site. So we have um, Antioch School, there's the preschool, and then there's Mills Lawn, which will be there for now. I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> um, but so you have this like educational opportunity. The other thing we liked about that location is that the village wants to do more with that park. And they want to actually, so if there are other art pieces that come on, if there's another sculpture pieces that come on, it's a natural fit. So you can actually build upon um, the idea of having a walking tour of art and, you know, and culture um, as well. So, I will say that we have gotten a lot of support from the village of Yellow Springs. It's village land. And so city council, um, I will say I'm biased, but the Yellow Springs Arts and Culture Commission um, has been incredible in terms of pushing forward uh, the Will and God Sculpture Project as well. And I will say on a personal note, I tend to be a little bit on the cynical side of government, you know, like, what do you, what do you need, you know, that kind of thing. I am honestly saying this has been a really incredible process. Like, it's really been pretty cool, you know. Um, the other thing um, about the process itself is that moving forward, we decided that we needed to involve the community more in this process. Now, my background with um, the City of Philadelphia Mural Arts Program is this. We have a mural. And the mural is on this wall, say, right here. Let's say these four people live right in front of this wall. Well, I can't just go into your neighborhood, colonize the wall, and put up a mural without talking to the people and seeing what they want. And if it's okay. At least that's what they used to do. They do now. <laughs> but so I would have a series of community meetings. I had two flyer, a two, two to four block radius around where this mural would be. We had community meetings. The artists had to speak to had to talk to the community about what that would look like. Um, they had to get to know the community. Your community wasn't just the people who lived in front of the mural, but it was village council. It was for Philadelphia, they have um, block cabins. Um, it was, they have a lot of community development corporations in different neighborhoods. You talk to them. It was Miss Millie, who everybody knew you didn't do anything without getting her approval. <laughs> and she was the one that swept her front porch and the street, down the street, but may have made $10,000 a year, but she had the social capital you got to know your community. What I feel about Yellow Springs is that that is the piece that we need to build. Because I feel like 
Yellow Springs has become so disparate, right? Generationally. Like, whenever I'm in Yellow Springs, I'm either around people that are clustered in their age group, you know, or um, there's, no, there's not as much integrating of people the way that I'm used to, quite frankly, when I lived on the East Coast. But what I would say about Yellow Springs, at least during the time that I grew up, I couldn't have done the work that I did in Philadelphia without having grown up here. Because as the middle class black kid, I went to school with the kid on the lunch plan, and I went to school with the CEO of Renee Lab, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, or the kid, you know, yeah. everybody was in the same classroom. I recognized that as much as I was like, oh, Yellow Springs, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> when I was away from Yellow Springs, I recognized that I took Yellow Springs with me. That is what I think is the saddest part for me right now. Because I don't know that that is what is going on or what will continue. Which is why Will and Gone is so important to me, personally. Anybody? I, you know, so that's my spiel right now. <laughs> Talk a little bit more, but anybody have any well, everybody knows Gaunt Park, and uh, I think there's a monument to him in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Is he buried in the cemetery? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he's well known in Yellow Springs, mm -hmm. and as far as uh, I'm not sure if he's the one who started the idea of giving um, flour yes. to widows yes. around Christmas time. Yes. So he's, he's got a legacy here that I'm surprised it took this long to build a monument to him. But we don't have any monuments in Yellow Springs to anyone else, do we? Um, we were doing, we were just talking about that last night. And as far as we know, no. That's right. Now, here's the thing though. There's a I mean, I don't want to say oh, we yeah. should. I'm just asking. No, no, no. I haven't no. seen any. I actually feel like my big thing is I I want to see us do something to honor Virginia Hamilton. You know, besides, I I will say that up front, like across the board. Next up should be her. That's that's my opinion. However, you'd be surprised at how many people don't know who Will and Gone is. It's In Yellow Springs. Yeah, yeah, new generations, and they don't know why they're getting flour and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting. So there was talk about putting the monument originally at Gaunt Park, mm -hmm. but we decided because the bulk of people that come through Yellow Springs come through downtown and they don't necessarily go to the park unless, you know, it's fireworks. Right. The best place to honor him would be right there. Now what I will say is that there are talks and we are finalizing some ideas about adding a mural to the swimming pool. But that's something that is a you know discussion that I'm sure will come at a different announcement. The thing is, um, when you're talking about um, a generation of people, like the, again, there's that disconnect. Um, one of the things that, I, this is kind of the second part of the conversation, which is around education. There are a couple of amazing things that happened um, through the schools. One is that there was a teacher, Akasa Sims, who a couple of years ago did a project-based <coughs> learning um, module around the life of Will and God. She had her first graders create an ABC book about the life of Will and God. Um, she had um, the 365 Project historian, um, Dr. Kevin Gruder, come in and talk to her class. They did a field trip walk up to uh, Gaunt's old house. So they did a lot of education around it. Now that book, they created a um, copies of that book, sold that book, and made a fun did a fundraiser and contributed $127 to the Will and Gaunt Sculpture Committee. The other thing, though, is that we got permission to recreate and reprint that book. And we have been able to sell that book. And I will tell you, teachers love that book. Um, I was on Arts, Art and Lawn 
um, this past August or whenever it was, I can't remember. But the biggest bulk of people that bought that book, they were teachers. So it, the idea they're looking for stuff like this. Um, we've been talking to the Greene County Library about how to make this more of a regional kind of effort. Um, because Will and Gott not only influenced Yellow Springs, Will and Gott bequeathed Wilberforce University a majority of his land when he passed away. Um, he also contributed some things to Xenia and also through the AME Church. So his, and I would, I would venture to say that at the time that he was here, we also have different areas like the Gamut House in Springfield that was uh, a stop along the Underground Railroad and was, and was owned by um, uh, free blacks as well. So we have this kind of regional history right here. Um, and I think people really don't understand what Ohio was in terms of like the development of, um, of African Americans in life and culture in this country. In the same way that I would venture to say that they don't know about indigenous populations in this country, but they are in this community whose land we are now resting on, by the way. But, and we need to honor that, we need to understand, you know, who, who we're standing with and what we've done. It all goes hand in hand. So when we talk about the education process when it comes to the first graders who loved that project. What we decided to do was last year we did our first annual community service award. We gave that award to the first grade class because of the work that they did. Because they need to be honored for it and they were at ambassadors to this history. The other thing is this year though, we now have, we're working with a middle school. And there's a teacher there that is doing a project around Will and Gaunt with her eighth graders. And her, she's a social studies teacher at Courtney O'Connor. And she's got a lot of uh, curriculum ideas, and I think it's going to drill down to some important things. Stay tuned. We'll make an announcement because they're going to have an exhibit night in April. But they're talking about doing a history book for their age group that can be done regionally. Um, we also have a fundraiser that was led by um, Kate here, in which all of the homerooms at Mills Lawn were given a bucket. And that bucket was put on the desk of every teacher. And their students brought in coins to contribute to the Will and God um, project. <coughs> the announcement will be made at how much they raised and all that will be uh, made at an assembly tomorrow. We, what I want to see happen though is I want to see the eighth graders in the room with the elders, in the room with the millennials, in the room with the Xers. Um, what I'm seeing is this happening over here, this is happening over here, this is happening over here, but we need to come again. And that's frankly my critique of my own project. <laughs> you gotta be real, you gotta be open, you gotta be honest, right? It's true. Yes. I'm going to jump in here. Okay. Um, I went to the program last night, too, and I've been aware of this for a really long time. Uh, and I'm a historian and a genealogist, etc. cetera. And uh, I myself am triracial. And so consequently, um, I think one the reason that we were given this project um, as almost a mandate that needs to be accomplished is that because Wheeling God himself was a first generation biracial child, he is the perfect blending. I like to say now that I'm blended <laughs> and that I don't, because the hardest thing for a child to do that's biracial is to pick between their races or to feel that if they're in a group, they've got to act this color, and if they're in this group, they have to act that color. And, and then to hear all of those colors say, you don't belong, because you don't look like us, because you end up not looking like any of them. And 
Um, I think that that is what Greene County was established as. The Quakers came here to live amongst the Indians. Uh, they were already mixed. My Quakers were mixed. Uh, my, babe, my black grandfather was a Quaker. And uh, I think that he is just the perfect example that he came here at a time in history. <coughs> and one of the things that came out last night was that he never said that the flour and the sugar would go to black widows. It went to all widows. He taught this community how to treat people equally and not to look at them differently and to believe that his black genes was allowed to be free and to be able to achieve anything that his white genes had already achieved for years. And he just didn't see that. And I think that um, that's what our kids need to know, that that opportunity is growing and growing. But it started here. It started here in Ohio. It started in this part of Ohio. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at the coordination with the history of Woolworth University, that's what it speaks to. Because many people are not aware of Woolworth University, the way that their students, their earliest students, were children of uh, slave owners. And they had sent their kids up north to go to school. Now, Tawawa Springs, the resort, I don't know how many of you are aware of this history, so, Tawawa Springs, if, you are, if you've ever been to the National African American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce, that's actually where that resort area was. And originally, um, Wilberforce University's campus, before it became Central States. So, there was a resort that was built there. It was a, like a hot springs. It was supposed to be a health resort. Health resort. Mm -hmm. When in reality, well, it was a health resort. But reality was that um, slave owners brought the, the women that were enslaved that they were having sex with up to summer with them at this resort. Now, <coughs> interestingly enough, the resort itself was employed a lot of free black blacks. So you can imagine the kind of <coughs> clashes and tenseness and stuff that would have occurred there, right? Well, that closed, and I won't get into kind of the detailed history of it, but then there was an opportunity for a, a privately owned historically black college to, um, to take over that land and open a college. The people that used to go to Tawawa Springs sent their, their kids to this college. We now know it became Rural Force University. The other thing, people, there are other kind of connectors. So I'm always fascinated about what's going on around that time period when William Gaunt was alive. Interestingly enough, I teach art history. So for me, um, my background, again, is art, but I teach theory classes because they're not, we don't have an art program, per se, at Wilberforce, although I kind of slide it in underneath stuff. <laughs> um, but I teach African art history, African American art history, um, art history, regular art history, and art appreciation, and the humanities a lot of times. And the other thing, piece of it is that people may not be aware that Elizabeth Peckley who was Mary Todd Lincoln's seamstress, also taught at Wilberforce University. <coughs> and her son attended Wilberforce University before he was killed in the Civil War. These are all contemporaries of Will and Don. And so I'm, I'm always thinking about this. I'm like, did they know each other? Like, we know there's evidence that Frederick Douglass, Daniel Payne, like all those people, they all kind of, you know, knew each other. But it's just so fascinating because part of part of the, the struggle, I think, and even Yellow Springs has this struggle, is the Yellow Springs Historical Society has 
this massive amount of information, and they're a volunteer group of people. And they have to um, mitigate how much they can go through. They just don't have the capacity. Well, what about, what are those nuggets you know, that are underneath all that history that's waiting to be discovered? And we find stuff over here. So Wilberforce may have some stuff. Payne Theological Seminary has stuff. Central State has stuff. Even Yellow Springs Historical Society has stuff. I found stuff about Antioch College and Wilberforce. So how do we bring all of this together? And so even though we're talking about you know, a monument to will and God, I think that this process has opened up this whole kind of conversation that needs to occur around um, legacy. Because as we know, and part of the reason why I think Will and God, and I, knew, and I know the organizers of this kind of second wave of wanting this sculpture, they were really looking at what's going down south and the idea of these Confederate monuments mm -hmm. and what are you remembering. And the response, which I think is the responsible response, <laughs> would be that we have to make sure that, that well, they say, what, the victors of history write the history. So we see that over and over again, like we have legacies and people that have disappeared, you know, and we only get one side of the perspective because we get the victor side. We know what we know about even ancient Egypt in many ways because, uh, you know, the Greeks, the Romans wrote about it, you know. Um, we know that to be the case um, with the history of, of this, you know, I say United States, and don't say America, because America is a, uh, is a continent, and there are how many countries besides the United States that live here, I mean, that reside on this hemisphere, right? So I'm very careful about <laughs> that language. But this isn't, I mean, all of us, with the exception of maybe a few of us, this isn't the land, this isn't our native indigenous land where here as visitors and in many cases generationally some of our folks quote unquote conquered to get here. Like I, I will say, you know, I'm not for saying that Africans were immigrants. Um, <laughs> some, of our you know, some of our textbooks like to kind of, you know, but that, again, you see what I'm talking about when it comes to history. Got to be very careful. There. Has there been any uh, movies or documentaries about the life of William Donald? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did a really good job the first year of documenting the process. Um, the issue is funds, and we have footage, we have a ton of footage around the process. Um, <coughs> our, uh, our, we hired um, Elias Kelly to do a lot of work in terms of capturing events, interviewing people. <coughs> got a lot of good information about you know the process with Brian Mon. But anybody in the film industry knows it's the editing, and so we do need to have a process or a fund raiser, quite frankly, and the will to do it, which is an internal conversation. And I will say straight up that I probably are, I, I probably would say that there is disagreement on the committee about that process and what is necessary um, and what needs to happen. Um, I'm, I'm careful about saying that, you know, publicly, hi, Cameron. But, <laughs> but there is, I mean, there, there quite frankly is. Um, I am on the side that uh, would vehemently say we need to do every and all we can, mainly because as African American and a person of African said, I know what that is. We have lost so much of our legacy, you know, disappeared, gone, because we didn't take proper care and documents, um, or couldn't take proper care, you know. So it's a, a lot of times it's a privilege. Hey, what about his descendants, or relatives, children? Um, do, do any of them still live in Yellow Springs, or where do they exist? <coughs> and, you know, it's interesting. So his, his white side of the family, they mm -hmm. still have descendants, and they live in Kentucky. 
Um, and a few years ago, part, some of their descendants came to visit Yellow Springs to see what it was about. Um, this is where the history gets a little murky. So when Willem Gott purchased his freedom, he purchased his freedom, he purchased his wife's freedom, and he also purchased a, a boy's freedom. And that boy, we think, was his son in some way, but we don't know. And he just kind of drops off. So he didn't leave any heirs, you know, here that we know of. We do know his sister um, eventually <coughs> made her way up here, and she lived in Xenia. So we know that there is on his, like, immediate kind of generational thing, but there's really not a lot of information. Who is his question? sister's name? I think it's Louisa. I, yes. I think it's Louisa. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just one of those things. Like, it's, it's very frustrating, and I say this as someone who, like, I also, because of where I work, and I don't think it's an open, I don't think it's a deep secret that Wilberforce University is in trouble, financially and otherwise. I don't, I think that, you know, it's pretty open. But it's the same thing there, like, the archives and things like that, they're there. But they need some, they need care and attention and maintenance. And, and money. money. Yeah. And so, what is our will? So, I give an example of something that I find very fascinating, I'm kind of going to kind of flip, do maybe a whiplash thing here. But, is anyone familiar with Kahende Wiley? So, Kahende Wiley is an artist, African American artist, who actually did the portrait of Barack Obama. Just to kind of give some context. So, but his whole thing is around historical references and representation. So what he does is he'll travel the world and he looks at colonialism um, through art. So what he does is he finds everyday people off the streets all over the world and he then goes to art museums and he looks at different historical um, images in history and he recreates those images using the people he's found <coughs> to be models off the street. Well, he, his latest venture though is sculpture. And what he did was, it's called, I wish I had a look here, I'll write it down. I'm gonna give you guys a couple of things here. So, that's his name. I'm gonna, if you YouTube World Tour, you'll find a lot of different information. And then, I'm gonna give you this. And please, my spelling. You know, <laughs> I don't, rumors, is that, I don't know, okay, it'll figure it out, so, right, okay. not my thing, it's good, okay, maybe that, there you, there you go, <laughs> so, he was walking in Richmond, Virginia, downtown, and he saw all of these Confederate monuments, and he was very disturbed by it. So he decided he was going to create his own sculpture in response to it. And I am going to actually, since I'm not going to take a picture, personally, I'm going to it up so you can see what he did. And I'm going to walk past everybody who can see it. You're welcome. It's pretty fascinating. 
the importance of being a part of community. <coughs> and so they have collected their coins, and as they said earlier, we'll know tomorrow what the exact amount is. But the lesson is, again, becoming a part of something larger than yourselves. And that's certainly what Wheeling Gaunt's legacy in um, some ways was. So thank you, Cheryl. I really appreciate your time. I we certainly have time. I have one Yes, question. I'm sorry, Kelly. I apologize. Last night, um, I was at the meeting last night as well, mm -hmm. and um, there was a quote that was going around, and I just wanted to verify whether or not that was a recent one or whether it was one from Wailing Gaunt. It's not what you have, but what you share. And it's Gaunt. Yeah, that's it, is that that is Gaunt. Direct yeah. from him? Yeah. yeah, that was really impactful for me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you know, um, is there any ever been thought of having uh, uh, grade school kids uh, participate in the delivery of the flour and sugar? You know, we actually talked about it this year. We, um, at the last, we, we actually did it this year. Mm -hmm. And then it was like such a last minute kind of coming together. But I think that is something that should be done. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that I think is coordinated through the schools. But what I will say is this. Um, I don't think that teachers are as nimble as they used to be in terms of being able to kind of turn on dimes with curriculum. Because they have very set kind of regimens about what they do. And I found that out, and we found that out even in terms of funding. So we wanted to do more stuff and coordinate more stuff, but we have to do it um, on a schedule that's based on their project-based learning kind of stuff. And that's fair. I mean, I, you know, you can't just call somebody and be like, hey. <laughs> but, but I think that it really is timing. I think that there's a will for it. And I think that, yes. it was, you know, enough time, we can definitely do it next year. Cheryl, <clears throat> I'm sure you remember that this town fills with tourists every Saturday. <clears throat> I think it would be insufficient just to have a statue, even if you had some leaflets at the base. But you have the opportunity to have young people work on Saturday to talk to the crowds and come. Otherwise, they'll look at the statue and they won't really know what it means, what it signifies. I agree with you. And, I, and um, uh, the 365 Project, one of the beautiful things that they do is they train young people to give tours. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're working to kind of build that um, part of of what they do in terms of the Blacks and Yellow Springs tours. Um, and I think that that is going to be a point of, of being able to address that. I also know that there is a lot of talk, and this is a task force committee um, that's just kind of starting, because we're looking at the home stretch of getting this sculpture bronzed, right? But what goes around, you can't just put up, you know, you can't just put up a sculpture and just be like, okay, that's it what goes around it, even down to the idea of what the land is going to look like. So there is kind of this discussion around, well, what's the information? The eighth grade class is even talking about what can we do to um, inform the public through our project as well. The, the bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. And it, was, had been used since ancient times in Egypt. Mm -hmm. There's a, an awful lot of significance to me. I'm a metallurgist, otherwise anyway. Um, of, the, of the importance of an alloy like that through the world, through time. Mm -hmm. And that could be used also, part of the business, to entertain people, to, to uh, make them aware of, of how bronze was chosen. I, the alloy for the sculpture. I agree 100%. I, I am right there with you because the bronze tells the story of the world, you know, and the origins of the world. I agree with you. I think it's not just, um, I, I encourage people to think beyond, I mean, we see Will and God, and we love Will and God, but to think about not just like cornering the man, but the representation, even the even the materials on which he was, like this whole process is part of, and that way you're drawing in people who, you know, okay, I like the sculpture, but man, I'm really into alchemy, <laughs> or you know, I'm really into to sci the science of metal, 
um, that's part of also like the land, what I would hope and encourage, I'm not sure will happen. But even having um, medicinal plants or something that grow around that, that was grown around the era in which he was there. You know, stuff like that I think would be how you start drawing people in. Okay, well this is the kind of treatment people had at the time that he was here. And, you know, this still grows here and native species and, you know, so you're bringing in botany, you're bringing in science, you're bringing in history, you're bringing in art. And so it's more of a multidiscipline. Okay. Um, and I'm hoping that that's going to happen. I'm not sure. You captured a great amount of history along with preparing for the statue. How are you going to uh, present that to the community, keep it uh, going? You're working with a historical society? Uh, with um, it will be, it's going to be a hybrid. I think it will be um, the 365 project will, will definitely be the main catalyst. Uh, for getting that information out. I, I will say that I'm not sure. I, we have the Yellow Springs Historical Society as part of our committee. Um, I'm not sure in response. I think that their internal discussion is going to be what kind of uh, role and responsibility they want to have with this process. Um, I will also say that the Chamber of Commerce is very interested in this, mainly because we talk about tourism. Mm -hmm. We know that the market is come to Yellow Springs, shop and hike, eat something. But <laughs> there's not there's not a historical element. And what mm -hmm. the conversation was is that they want one, but the capacity to put that together is mm -hmm. what <coughs> is lacking. Mm -hmm. So we need to have that conversation mm -hmm. because. There are plenty of people that want to know about the historic, you know, the historic mm -hmm. uh, community mm -hmm. that we are part of. I realize you have a full plate of uh, managing this here, but has there been thought given to making it more regional, let's say a tie-in with uh, the Parker House in Whistley and the Rankin House and the whole story that, uh, <coughs> flows from that? We have had conversations about it. Um, I know we have talked about it in the sense of approaching um, a, what's the organization that's responsible for the regional tourism. But I think that there is something to what you're saying because I know we have talked about um, that there needs to be more of a link, like you can see almost like a bus tour where you're going from the Gammon House to uh, Yellow Springs and getting a tour here um, and going, you know, just doing something around that, even ranking in uh, Ripley, Ohio. If people were really, I mean, I, in reality, we live in a world in which people want to monetize things, but if people were really thinking about and that's not, I mean, we've talked about it, but that's not kind of in our, you know, mm -hmm. bailiwick right now to do. Mm -hmm. I would love to see it happen. Mm -hmm. um, personally, and I know people would, it's just I think the will to mm -hmm. get it there. Mm -hmm. Just at the other end of 68, or not the other end. Right. It's, if you go much further, you can get your feet wet. Exactly. <laughs> well, right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's exactly... The, it's, it's almost like the perfect setup, really. Mm -hmm. I know part of the discussion included having QR codes. Is that right? I think you know, it's called QR codes, where you can link in to additional information, um, right at the statue, having either a plaque talking about the experiences <coughs> of willing uh, really them also being able to electronically Mm -hmm. connect into additional information that mm -hmm. I imagine the council would prepare along with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I don't know. I know we've talked about it. Okay. I know that it is a distinct possibility to probability. <laughs> <laughs> but who manages that exactly. piece of it is kind mm -hmm. of the issue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Did you have a question? Oh, <clears throat> the statue will be outside, exposed to the elements. Um, is there any maintenance involved in once it's built and exposed to the elements? Yeah, absolutely. And what's, that's, what's involved? Well, that's part of what the task force, the um, site task force um, that's being put together is going to be dealing with. But it's going to be kind of this quasi thing where the village is, because it's on village land, you know, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be um, definitely doing a lot of the maintenance. But then the Village Arts Council, or Yellow Springs oh, okay. Arts Council, will have some role in that process mm -hmm. um, as well. Bob? The, um, there will be a, a, a glaze that will, that will appear on the statue. You've seen it in many statues mm -hmm. that, that were, have been cast in bronze I over see. many, many years. Mm -hmm. But it is, a, it is a protective cover, mm -hmm. so it's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't stick out funny or anything like that. Right. It's very smooth mm -hmm. uh, and actually brings more character, I think. To the statue than when it's just cast. How long does it last? Hundred years? Two hundred years? Forever? Forever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you you go to the south, okay. and you and in um, I, I don't know that where the war was fought, yeah. you can find statues that have been around for several hundred years. Yeah. The Statue of Liberty, for instance, is that, well, is that an example of lasting? Of course. A long time. Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Karen. Oh, oh, there's one. Go ahead. Oh, please. Cheryl, in doing all your research, have you come across a, a book that you might recommend on wheeling God for folks who might not know or want to dip their toe in reading? Or is this information tucked away in primary sources? in libraries, <laughs> archives. Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's great you mentioned that. I'm glad you did because last night one of our keynote, one of our present presenters was Brenda Hubbard. Right. Now Brenda Hubbard is actually coming out with a book this summer. Right. Um, hers is gonna, I believe, be kind of a hybrid where she, you're gonna have kind of a factual, uh, you're gonna get a factual story of Will and Gaunt, but also it's, it's, it's memoir as well. Um, but as far as straight facts, it's really quasi, you know, it's, I mean, Phyllis Jackson went to Carrollton, Kentucky and did research and found out a lot of information about him in Kentucky. Um, I really believe there's probably stuff in the Yellow Springs Historical Society, but it's a matter of how you would find it and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, I just wish we had funding and we could hire a bunch of professional dumpster diver historians <laughs> and you go through all the, you know, bins and you find the nuggets and, you know, and then you build the, the house. I think 365, Pam, 365 Project's website is just full of this information. Mm -hmm. It's actually the boat when I was digging around in it to get stuff to the school kids. That's the place I found the most all compiled mm -hmm. versus a little bit here, a little bit there. That that one was the, really the best. Okay. So. And I will say real quick, I should put a plug in. Um, the uh, Project 365 just produced an encyclopedia. Oh, yeah. You can purchase it for $15, and it's the Black and Yellow Springs Encyclopedia. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's a great find. Yeah. So I would suggest, um, you know, I, you know, they're, they're just, they're the game in town, man. They're holding it together for mm -hmm. the, the history. And so um, we need to support that. I hope everyone agrees that we need to support that as much as possible. It's something mm -hmm. about Will and Gun getting the encyclopedia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's what's, I think, fascinating is that if you have not gone on any Blacks and Yellow Springs tours, um, the other thing is that if you, I believe, not quote me, but I don't believe, even if you have issues with walking, they yes. will do a driving tour. They do. <laughs> yes. And yes. so, um, I encourage that. The one that I actually was floored by, besides Will and Gaunt, what is the Blacks in Real Estate Tour? That one was wow. Because you would be amazed at who owned what and when. 
The, the building that this is going, the statue will be in front of, the old, the new old train station, has a lobby that's used just for pamphlets. That would be a good location for a video clip, a, a display explaining the statue and and his life a little bit. That might be a project for uh, project-based learning or an Antioch uh, effort. You're absolutely right, and mm -hmm. I think that we should show this video clip at the timestamp <laughs> <laughs> to the chamber, because <laughs> I think you're, at, you're on to something. Yeah. I was actually thinking it probably would be a great YouTube, because everybody's got a phone, and they could like walk up to the statue, and if somehow we have, you know, go to this YouTube, then we could have an automatic YouTube that gives them all the information, and even a walk through to through town to what his properties were. And I mean, there's been, like, there's so many different aspects. Like there are people that have ideas of like even commissioning some sort of dramatic reinterpretation, so that that's something that can be done um, even in front of the sculpture. Um, there's so many different ways. I, I'm open to everything because what I'm saying is that I, I feel a very strong connection to a kitchen sink approach in the sense that um, we have so many people, the sound bites in which people generationally respond to is so different. So you have to really do your homework and understand that, yeah, okay, I'll sit through a half an hour reinterpretation, but um, you know, if I'm 15 and I go on 30 second sound bites, then I'm not going to necessarily sit through that. You know, I'll sit through it, but I'm going to be doing this the whole time. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But we need to kind of, we, we just need to accept that that's the reality. Yeah. Instead of being like, I guess don't listen. Da, 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 da. They listen in a different way. Different in a different way. way. Yeah. Being a pragmatist, uh, I, I applaud the sighting of the thing close to the train station and close to the police station for security reasons. Should have 24 7 camera, a number of other attributes because as you probably know we lost a historic marker on near the bike path near Grinnell Road a number of years ago. Mm -hmm and we wouldn't want to do that again. I agree, and I also think, um, unfortunately, based on the racial climate in our community, uh, not necessarily in Yellow Springs, but in our surrounding communities, um, that the reality for vandalism is, is being, you know, pragmatic. I'm pragmatic. <coughs> Any other questions? I'd just like to make a pitch again for the the assembly at Mills Lawn tomorrow at two o'clock. The presentation of the donation of the Kids Kids Names and Key Association to the Yellow Springs Arts Council. It's in the gym. It's at two o'clock. The kids are very excited about this. They really, really got into this fundraising project. So every day for two weeks, they had a fact on their Bulldog News. They had the Wheeling Go On Fact of the Day. So they got a lot of education along the way uh, with this. So, and the message about being part of community was premier for why they were doing this. So it's very excited, very excited. So, but it's going to be a big surprise. And I can't be there. I know you can't. I already heard that. It's sad. I'm like so sad. I, I love the kitties. Oh, man, they're really enjoying it. We're having a great time with this. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, we have cookies. <laughs> <laughs>